Hello, David Tritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. I am here with none other than Elliot Mason. Elliot, thank you for inviting me to your incredible place. It's a pleasure. Thank you for uh, flying across the pond to see I, us. Just for this. Indeed. It's not like there's any James Bond celebrations other than this place right here. Now, we've been, we've been conversing through email, horrific email, for years. This is the first time we're meeting. I think it must be seven or eight years, maybe even longer. Am I taller than you expected? <laughs> never, never. But hey, listen, first of all, tell us where we're standing right now. Uh, we are at 34 Montague Square mm -hmm. in Marlebone, so London's West End. Um, and it was the former home of John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, Ringo Starr, uh, Paul McCartney, but not all at the same time. Oh my gosh. Um, but Coincidentally, we found out after we had uh, taken residence here that Ian Fleming also lived on Montague Square You're um, when he was demobbed. So there's a bond connection here too. Oh my gosh. So this was like the perfect entity. You have a lot of inspiration here is what you're saying. Plenty. Plenty. All right. <laughs> well, you've been on a journey with me and we've got to explain to everybody what's happening because something very special is happening here. Something special always happens here. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about an overarching aspect of the brand itself that you that you are part of. Yeah, well, we um, relaunched Anthony Sinclair in 2012, uh, which was 10 years ago. Oh my gosh, already. <laughs> and it was a um, 50th anniversary for Bond, mm -hmm. as you know. That's right. Uh, but it was also a very big year for London because uh, it was the Olympics ceremony. Right. And uh, you might remember that uh, Her Majesty the Queen jumped out of a helicopter with Vaguely, yes. Daniel Craig, yeah, uh, or James amazing. Bond. Right. Um, so it was a Bond mania here in mm -hmm. London and across the world. Mm -hmm. So it was a fantastic time to relaunch 007's original tailoring brand. And uh, we launched the business just right off Savile Row by Sackville Street. Oh. Um, which is the opposite side of Savile Road to where Anthony Sinclair originally was, oh. which was Conduit Street. Um, so the Conduit Cut is named after where his former residence was back when Connery was going to get fitted for the suits. I was zero years old when I found that out. Seriously, I didn't even know that. That's insane. And, and just for everybody kind of watching this from a sartorial standpoint, I think it's important to note that Anthony Sinclair was the tailor that did Sean Connery for every one of his Bond movies except for Never Say Never Again, is that right? That is absolutely right. That's amazing. So this particular brand, it obviously has a certain amount of gravitas and history. As a company, how important was it for you and your family to really go back to the roots and make sure that everything was authentic? Um, I think it would have been impossible for us to have relaunched the brand uh, without doing that. And yeah. we had, um, well, we had quite a fortuitous way of relaunching the brand and that was doing it alongside Anthony's apprentice Richard Payne. Oh. So uh, when Anthony Sinclair passed away, he had before doing so, he handed the keys um, to his shop down to his apprentice Richard Payne and also he handed his shears which are just on the mantelpiece there down to Richard uh, and Richard continued to operate the business for a number of years and then as he was the head cutter, he was making the suits, he was looking after the customers, he decided that it should be his name to go uh, in the suits. So he changed it to Richard Payne. This was before uh, the Bond Experience YouTube channels, all the suits of James Bond blogs, before there was real uh, worldwide internet, the blogosphere had, to, you know, the branding wasn't there. Right. So um, Anthony Sinclair as a brand isn't what, was not what we turned right. it into. Um, so Rick, it was 10, 20, maybe even 30 years after Richard had uh, changed the label in the suits to Richard Payne that my dad worked with him to bring the brand back to life and there was, there was nobody better to do it with. Fortuitously, we had a customer and friend who at that time owned a suit from You Only Live Twice. He actually owned an original Connery oh suit, which are incredibly rare because we are told that he, uh, so Sean used to take them with him right. when the films uh, finished. And I believe that he once had a, an, a bill with a bill with his accountants that he decided to settle with some oh. old film. So there was, I don't even think Eon have too many of the original pieces That's of right. clothing. They don't. So in 2012, when we relaunched the brand, 
Um, the Barbican were also doing a Designing 007 exhibition that went on a round the world tour. So they commissioned us to remake the Goldfinger suit and a midnight blue uh, shawl collar dinner suit, mm. two of our most popular items. Yeah. Uh, and Richard was able to recreate both of these suits or recut them to this exact same uh, size and specification because he was able to draft a pattern backwards from this completed, you only live twice, grey herringbone suit, um, which is a suit that used Hollander cherry cloth mm -hmm. and they still weave the exact same cloth. Oh my gosh. But, um, that's almost 60 years later. That's unbelievable. No, I, first of all, we love the stories, but I think also our favorite products, whether they bond, be Bond brands or not, if there's a story woven deeply, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of heritage and story that we feel like we have ownership of. I think it's part of the acquisition, like this is a very good watch, but the history of this particular watch makes it even more special. So your, your Anthony Sinclair brand, obviously it elevates, but something happened. So um, I am here right now, um, not just for this gentleman, although that be, would be worth the trip, uh, <laughs> but also for a week of celebration of James Bond. And one of the places I will be going to is actually having a tour, a private tour with the president of Aston Martin, Paul Spears, um, and some of his other people around Aston Martin works. Wow. Seeing the DB5, et cetera. And I thought to myself, what if we could dovetail some of these things with me actually having made, by all of you, the Goldfinger blue suit? Because that's something unique, right? Everybody tends to go to the Kentucky one. If you're going for the Goldfinger suit, there's usually the gray, mid, gr mid gray, Glen check. Right. Goldfinger suit. And uh, the Navy suit isn't necessarily known as the Goldfinger suit. No, but no. I think uh, for the reason that you need it, it probably should be known as the Goldfinger suit. It is. And since this, and this, this literally happened this morning, um, I'll also be on BBC World uh, Television in this particular suit talking about auspiciously exactly what we're talking about right now is what lengths do fans and lovers of James Bond go to sort of wrap themselves and literally there's a pun there of kind of the Bond franchise and so I couldn't think of another and better brand to do it than Anthony Sinclair. Excellent. So we're here. The fabric was picked out. We'll show some of that particular process but once somebody says like a David Zaritsky comes along and says all right I want to do this and you go wow. Um, what happens then? You've got to do fabric measurement. What's the process? Yeah, so when uh, a customer comes to see us, uh, usually they have an idea of what they would like. Very often they go onto our website and see one of the examples that we have and say, right. I would like this. And every now and again, they may want to make a small change. Um, if their suit has got ticket pockets, they may want it exactly the same, but without the ticket pocket, mm. etc. So we would come in and um, if they know which suit they want, because they've seen the sample, uh, we would just pull out the fabric bunch and say, this is the fabric, you know the styling details. Um, otherwise, we, customers will come in and we'll go on a bit more of a journey. Right. Um, and usually customers decide if they want blue or something else. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we would start, I tend to ask customers if they want a four seasons weight fabric or something more seasonal, so a flannel or a linen in summer. Right. And then if they want a plain fabric or something with a stripe or a check, and then we get sort of down into the nitty gritty deciding which shade of blue they want and um, and then the styling details. Right. And it's, it's interesting too because speaking of styling details, there are some people that will say, well, like, I don't want pleats. I want this to be about me. And like I said, no pleats, even yes. though there'd be pleats. Um, but there'd be other features like certain buttons or things around it. I mean, you can get pretty detailed. Uh, absolutely. We've... Um, Especially if it's recreating one of the original Sinclair suits for Connery, we can get incredibly detailed. Um, it does vary. Some suits we have incredible records of and um, photo archives. And uh, the suits that perhaps only got s seen for a moment in one of the films, um, it's harder. And we have to sort of use a bit of uh, creative 
ingenuity to yeah. sort of determine what the likely styling details would have been. But there tends to be quite a lot of consistency throughout the films with what he goes for. But the trousers are always easiest. They're usually always pleated and usually always have dax top adjusters. Um, most of the uh, suit jackets tend to have jetted pockets. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, you know, it's the, they, they pretty much all have a four button cuff. Right. Um, and then the other issue is, of course, is if we're not sure what kind of buttons the suit has, we might, again, think about what else has been worn during the film or the, that particular run of films. Um, and because uh, the, sometimes we get um, images that are sort of, well, none of it was uh, high res back then, but <laughs> yes. more high res than others. Right. Um, the biggest challenge, actually, that I always find is um, ensuring that the color is correct. So one of the challenging pieces that we've done in the past, just in terms of color matching, has been uh, the Barley Cornsweet hacking jacket and cavalry twill trousers. Mm. Because in just about every picture you see, it's a different color. That's true. Um, so that's one area, again, where we have to... if the mill doesn't still make the identical fabric, right. we sort of have to um, take a best estimate and uh, reach out to other other friends in the in the Bond world who might be able to True. Other detectives, if you Indeed. will. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's, we're going to talk about fit. But before we do that, why don't we relocate ourselves here and take a look at the jacket? Shall Fantastic. We? Absolutely. So here it is in all its glory. It looks... I mean, just visually, it looks absolutely amazing. We'll get some close-up of the fabric, of course, later. But talk to us a little bit about the details, maybe, that were captured here. Absolutely. So for most of the uh, Connery suits that Sinclair created, the biggest difference between the ones that we do today and the ones that were done in the 1960s, visually, that is, is probably the lapel width. Uh, and also where the chest pocket is, because Connery was so broad and yeah. so big, what you often notice is that his chest pocket, the gap between the chest pocket and the lapel um, is much greater. And for two reasons, just because of the breadth of his chest, mm -hmm. um, and it would be odd to have a really long chest pocket. And the other thing is that we tend to keep the lapels at a slightly more modern width. So these are eight centimeters. I'm not sure what that is in inches off the top of my head. Um, but <laughs> we, could, we could do the centimeter thing. Yeah. <laughs> but that is fairly average by okay. today's standard. We can do narrow lapels if customers want, but what I find is that they tend to date the suits. And really, what we're saying is that you know the suits that we make is, should be timeless. Yeah. Um, and the lapel width is often the biggest telltale sign mm -hmm. about, uh, to age it. So I think that going for this sort of width works really well. Um, we have a soft natural shoulder, which you'll be able to tell when it's actually on, as opposed right. to on the hanger. And then a roped sleeve head, which is uh, the sort of prominent style in that period for Savile Row Taylors. Um, this is one of the styling details that is on most of Connery suits on the pockets, is these jetted pockets without flaps, without ticket pockets. It's definitely a more formal look. Uh, and the fact that they're straight always also lends itself to being slightly more formal. Uh, the most interesting feature for me on this particular suit that you have chosen is the button choice. And that Crazy. is Crazy. fabric covered buttons, yeah. which isn't, which is quite rare on Connery suits. But again, it's very sort of of the period as well, yeah. that sort of mid to late 60s period, when you see uh, old mods and rockers on, on uh, on their style of suiting and the Beatles, so you often see fabric covered buttons. So right. um, it's probably more uh, Beatles than, than James <laughs> Bond, actually, but um, a really nice sort of quite different choice to go for uh, when recreating one of Connery's suits. It's definitely not the most obvious one. No, it's not. <laughs> and you've got the notch lapel here. Yeah, so we've gone for uh, the notch lapel and also, which is quite unusual uh, on a formal suit, is this swelled edge around the side. Mm. Um, it's probably quite difficult to pick it up on the camera. I'm not sure in the light, but we've, the fabric is actually a, uh, a navy herringbone. And again, this is one of those fabrics that when you're looking at old footage or old movie stills, is really difficult to identify. Um, whether it's a herringbone or not, it can change during the lights. When it's a dark blue, it's really difficult for obvious reasons sure. to detect what's actually happening. So the, the in the film, it does look like it's quite a 
full it has a quite a lot of fullness to the fabric mm -hmm. uh, but in this we've gone for a sort of four seasons perennial weight um, that Holland and Sherry do. And by the way that's something to point out that was a request by the client me of I tend to get overheated very easily so I want something light I don't want a flannel or anything that I'm going to be just too bogged down by and correct me if I'm wrong on the black on the back we have the double that's the, right so we've got uh, double vents the double vents which is very British isn't it it's only like it's yeah. nothing it is yeah. yeah that's what you tend to see more often than not right um, on evening wear you tend to see uh, scent vents or no vents at all okay this was great and again you know we're showing you some close-ups as well but fit wise typically speaking we didn't have a typical thing I know you did this you know relatively on a conjugated basis but typically what would be the process as far as fitting a client and um, so the process varies a little bit depending on if a customer is going for uh, English bespoke or made to measure mm. uh, English bespoke there are far more measurements and the process to is, happens over a few months or depending on where the customer lives could be you know six months eight months nine months um, and there are multiple fittings and the you go on a sort of journey with the suit through its different levels that's when you see lots of white stitching the basting thread and things like that the thing that we tend to do most often is made to measure mm -hmm. and for that we use a series of try-on garments to help us with the fitting process uh, for sort of speed and efficiency and so that when we take the initial measurements from the customer um, we don't sort of disappear for a few months and come back with a completed suit and say ta-da. Yeah, uh, yeah. But with the try-on garments it gives our customers the opportunity to actually put something on. It won't be perfect but it'll be the closest best fit to their size in a stock size mm -hmm. just to get a really good idea of what to expect and the uh, changes and um, alterations and adjustments that we're going to do to really perfect it. Uh, so usually we would do that in person, e either here in Montague Square or in one of our, well, in our other showroom in the US in Houston, Texas, or on one of our trunk shows usually. That used to happen all around the world at the moment, though right. it sort of tend to just be happening within the US. Yeah, and we, we did it. Um, I did a try on suit. Um, I had a, a wonderful experience with that and kind of like turn here, flex, do these things. Because what I loved about your particular process is you have to move in these things. This is mm. a, about you not feeling restricted. It's not body armor. It's something that you want to live in and have over time. So with that being said, should we try it on? Please. Okay, here we go. Exactly. And then it's just the uh, the cuffs making it seem strange. So we'll just tuck those. Oh, because they're so long? Yeah, they're yeah. so long, but... Short arms, here you go. <laughs> Sorry. This is amazing. Yeah, let's have a look at just with uh, those collars in. So you could probably really see that shoulder now. Oh yeah. Rope sleeve, very soft and natural, and then in the waist, We've got that the nice suppression, suppression. Is perfect. and then a bit of drape in the chest as well, where we might be concealing. Nice straight leg with a small taper towards the bottom, just breaking ever so slightly on the laces. It's so nice to have a leg that isn't a tongue board, like where it's like a little tight. Mm. It's like that's this is how a suit should look. Oh my gosh. So there's a lady's hair on there. I don't know how that got on there already. I'm going to assume that the tailor was. 
So this is what it's uh, looking like, kind of right off the cuff. Now, obviously, it's a try-on shirt. So you know, tomorrow, for example, you'll see it all sort of decked out. But this this feels amazing. Looks fantastic. Really smart. You happy with the way it came out? Beautiful. Absolutely love it. The details on it. First of all, I've got a you know, this is my this is like an unboxing, but with a suit. My immediate reaction is comfort. As strange as that is, it's not even accuracy. The accuracy is so visually there. So it looks like it popped out of the movie and flew on to me. But um, just as far as like ease of movement, I, I seriously feel like I can do anything. There are some suits where people walk around like RoboCop. Mm. Um, this just feels like there's good movement and that's not just a sign of the, of the good cloth, I think, but the tailoring of it is just knows my body of how I should move and it feels great. Excellent, yeah. Well, we try a cut a relatively high armhole, right. that, which gives you the movement. Um, and then the drape in the chest will also just give you that little bit of freedom. Gun has a full canvas construction. And they, it, has, uh, it has my uh, DMZ in there, <laughs> the demilitarized zone. <laughs> you get up in there. How great is that? And that's the Holland and Cherry mark of goodness, 1826. Not on. It's older than me, not by much. But oh, this feels so great. Absolutely beautiful. All right, Elliot, you know how we roll. Yeah. So this is one aspect of it, but this is about wearing out in the wild Absolutely. and seeing how it performs. So we'll circle back to you and we'll let you know, okay? Fantastic. Amazing. Thank you very much. Okay, well, this seemed like an appropriate place to talk about the final finished suit. Now, mind you, this has been a few weeks, maybe more than a few weeks, since I was in London in that scene that you just saw with Elliot. And that's because I had to test drive this. In fact, it's been so long, I, I grew a beard. But listen, this is about wearing these things out in the wild. First of all, here it is in all its glory with the shirt, tie, pocket handkerchief, Ignore the mic, ladies and gentlemen. I've got uh, a Spectre watch on because I thought, I don't know, I don't know. Just kind of looked good with the suit. Uh, take a look now. You can see kind of the fabric and the light, a little bit more of those beautiful covered buttons. I am so digging those. Absolutely. And you can see if I kind of move back the way the suit falls and drapes. Uh, the movement of this is amazing, but let's Let's break this down a little bit because now you've got to hear from me on how this suit is when I was wearing it. And there was quite a few times to really put this thing through its paces. First of all, um, almost immediately, I went to Aston Martin Works. You probably maybe saw the video where I walked through and I took a look at the DB5 and I took a tour. Paul Spires, who's the president of Aston Martin Works, took me on a, a, an amazing tour of this and we got to play with not one but two $4 million <laughs> DB5s. I did it in this suit, which was kind of like one of the main purposes to get this suit was, you know, to do the whole sort of reenactment, if you will, of that Connery moment where he walks over to the car, checks it out, etc. I wanted to be in that correct suit and really light Aston Martin on fire, really impress them and it did the trick. Plus, I will tell you, this suit that day, I wore it all day. I wore it in an Uber to get there, hour and a half. I wore it on the full tour, four hours. And then I wore it to back again into London, another hour and a half. And this suit was comfortable. And I gotta talk about that because I have suits, and yeah, I'll mention them. I have Tom Ford suits and quite a few of them. And sometimes, you know, you can really move and sometimes it's a little bit more like, you know, kind of armor, you know, dun, dun, dun. This suit, the movability in it is remarkable. And yes, I get it, that's what a good suit should do. And it's been sort of measured and made to measure for me, et cetera. So it does move nicely, but you're gonna notice that the sleeves and everything in here are still very straight. They're not bunching up. It fits me. It's got the suppression of the waist, but it's not too tight. It doesn't look like it was spray painted on. Everything connects very well. And because of that, the range of movement, if I had to do, why am I, why am I doing things like Elliot Carver? Don't do that, David. Uh, my range of movement is perfect. You can see we're going to go like, because this is what we do. We're going to go in the back. 
You can see the way it fits and moves. It doesn't hug and bunch and wrinkle on me. And that's good. That's exactly what we want. Now, this wasn't the only time in London that I wore this suit. I also wore it on the BBC, BBC World News. Uh, quite a big audience, as, as you may have known. I did a video on that as well. And the reporter interviewed me, the reporter, listen to me, the anchor, she interviewed me. And she asked me, what makes you a super fan? And I gave her an example. And the example was this suit. You know, having a suit made like this by the original template tailor, Anthony Sinclair, now owned by Mason and Sons, to do this in the correct type color with the correct buttons, using Matt Spazer as a consultant, all these different things coming together and then going to play with Aston Martins, that's kind of a super fan to me, to me. There's all types of super fans, super fans. You could be watching Bond all day. I get it. It was my definition, but I use the suit as an example of going that little added distance. So the suit was, it was a functional prop on the BBC to explain the fanatical level that I bring my passion, which is the sartorial passion to. Now I've actually worn the suit to business meeting. And the, it, it was great because, well, it's got all this push and pull. And what I mean by that is I love the push of wearing something that's connected to the franchise, especially an amazing film like Goldfinger. It's iconic. I don't know if you can get more iconic than Goldfinger. So, and it's one of my favorites. Cue Gold Naked Lady in the background. But having that connection is so powerful. But I also, if that's the push, I like the pull. And the pull is this invisible cover that goes over us that nobody out in the wild knows that this was made Anthony Sinclair, that it's a Goldfinger outfit, that I had it done in London. That's my story. If I want to share it, I can share it. But if I don't want to, I don't. Uh, by the way, <laughs> some of the things we didn't even talk about in there were some of the details. Uh, obviously, there is my, yeah, yeah, there it is right there. That's my uh, monogram. And the pockets in here, the the slash pockets, the slope pockets, the scallop pockets, just everything is so thoughtful. So all the modern conveniences that you need, like a phone holder and all those things, with old world charm, heritage, creation, to make a suit like this. And I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, working all of those together collectively to make something for a pretty discerning customer, that's what I was looking for. So. Thank you doesn't cover it. <laughs> you know, thank you to Elliot, to David, to Ryan, to all the people at Mason and Sud, uh, Anthony Sinclair, the brand itself, and putting all of these experiences together. I mean, it was so amazing going from a virtual experience to being, you know, in their actual studio, to being kind of remeasured and tweaked. And I can't believe this. I forgot one very important place that I wore this, and it has all to do with Anthony Sinclair. It does. I was invited to one of their celebration parties, a pre-celebration of their 60 pieces for the 60th anniversary. And this was something that they had um, at their showroom where they have all the different cloths, etc. But then they took us to Les Ambassadeurs Club, yeah, where they had Dr. No, where they filmed and he did the amazingly iconic line of Bond, James Bond. Uh, that's there. They had a party. We took pictures. We had drinks. There was an amazingly cool invitation. And of course, I had to represent by wearing this suit. So I've worn this thing in a very short order at least four times out in the wild. I think, I think I'm okay now to say that I've given it an appropriate field test to give it two thumbs up. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everybody that worked with to create this and it's amazing. Now, it's not the end of this story. It's not. I mean, every time I wear it, there'll be a new part of the story, granted. But next year, there is, I hear, even more coming out around these 60 pieces, even more experiences that we may be covering around this. So this, we'll call this a part one, if you will, and what a part one we had. So I'm gonna enjoy this suit. In the meantime, I will let you go. 
And this has been David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from The Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.